This is part six of the implications of, of eschatology and here I just want to kind of sum up a couple of things and usually when a person gets to this point well, they have a ton of questions and they'll say what about this passage and what about the Antichrist and what about Ezekiel 38 39 and uh, what about uh, Israel? I, I, I don't want to burden you with all of these things. Uh, I, I just want to touch on a couple of things. The first thing I want to deal with are, are time texts. Uh, we have already seen in Matthew chapter 24, this generation is a time indicator. Uh, Matthew 16, 27, and 28 is a time indicator. There are some who are standing here who will not taste, taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Words like near, shortly, and quickly are also used in, in Scripture to indicate an, a, a prophetic event that's on the horizon. Verse 7 of, of James chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's near. Uh, do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Now, that's the same language that is used in Matthew chapter 24, uh, Verse 33, even so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. And you will find these, these time indicators all the way through Scripture, especially near, shortly, and quickly, uh, an indication that Jesus was, des was describing uh, and a prophetic event was on the horizon for that particular generation. Uh, then there are passages which deal with time indicators, which deal with the, the, um, the end of the age, the, the so-called last days. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. In these last days, the last days of the Old Covenant, Jesus talked about the end of the age. Uh, and uh, the, the, the disciples understood when the end of the age was in fact when the temple on, on all of those things related to the temple would in fact be destroyed. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26, otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the consummation of the ages he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. See, they, the, the, the early church was living at the consummation of the ages. This wasn't something that was going to take place in the distant future. The old covenant order was going to was coming to an end. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 11. Now these things happened to them, talking about Old Covenant Israel. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Uh, we have to remember here uh, that the Bible is a covenantal book. It deals with the issue of God's covenant with Israel. And that covenant with Israel was going to ex expand and include uh, uh, Jews and Gentiles, and they would be grafted into one new man in Jesus Christ, Ephesians chapter 2. And so when it says here, um, and they were written for our instruction upon, the whom, upon whom the ends of the ages have come, this Old Testament Jewish exclusiveness was gone. And there would, be, there would be a new body of believers. There would be the, the makeup of Jews and Gentiles from all over the world, and they would, they would create a new man in Christ. Um, they would be this, the stones of the temple, Jesus being the cornerstone, and the rest of us making up the other stones that would make up a new temple. The old temple of stone would pass away. So keep in mind when you come across uh, words like near, shortly, and quickly, that it should give you some indication that events are on the horizon. Now, obviously, I don't have time to go through everything related to the book of Revelation, uh, but let me point out a couple of time indicators here. Uh, there's a big debate about the book of Revelation as to whether it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 or after the destruction of Jerusalem about A.D. 95. And uh, when I was in seminary, uh, typically we were told, well, all, all of the, the scholarly um, uh, evidence is on the A.D. 95 date. Well, as, as I've uh, 
since graduated from, from seminary and done reading on my own, I found out there's a great deal of evidence indicating that the book of Revelation was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And let me just give you a couple of key indicators here. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must shortly take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant. John, verse 3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Then you go to the very last chapter of the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 22, verse 10, and he said to me, that is, the angel said to John, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Now this is interesting because when Daniel is given a prophecy, he is told to seal up the prophecy for many days hence, for a time in the future. Now, Revelation, I believe, is the, is the opening of these uh, prophecies from the book of Daniel. They're opened up for that particular time period. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. If they haven't been, um, if these events have not been, in fact, uh, brought to pass, come to pass, then 2,000, 2000 years is a long way to indicate the word, the word near. Uh, so Revelation itself tells us that the events described therein refer to events that are on the horizon. Uh, we, we know, at least we have some evidence, that the book of Revelation was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem because John is told to measure the temple in Revelation chapter 11. And there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it, and leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for forty-two months. Now, you, this means that the temple was still standing. John was told, now he's, he's certainly... Uh, he's, he was taken up into heaven, uh, but he's told to measure the temple. And the t we know that the temple was still standing prior to its destruction in A.D. 70. There is no temple mentioned uh, in, the, in anywhere in the New Testament that's going to be rebuilt. So the temple, is, since it was still standing, the book of Revelation was written uh, prior to its destruction. Uh, we also know that the holy city uh, had been treaded underfoot for, uh, for approximately three and a half years or for 42 months. This again supports the idea that the book of Revelation is describing events that were near on the horizon. People say, well, you know, what, the, if you interpret the Bible literally, how do you get, get to that point? Well, you, I don't know anybody who really interprets the Bible literary, literary, literally uh, since John is told the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must shortly take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. And the word here, to show, is to, is to signify or to signify. These are signs. These are, these are symbols uh, that are drawn mostly from the Old Testament. Uh, here you have um, uh, you know, this a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars. You have, you have a dragon. Um, uh, that has, uh, has seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems. Uh, you have all these Old Testament illustrations. You talk about Sodom and Egypt. Uh, you talk about Jezebel. All of these Old Testament symbols and so forth are brought into the book of Revelation. So when someone says they interpret the Bible literally, they're constantly going through the Bible, through the book of Revelation, and they're saying, hey, uh, this, this symbol represents this, and this symbol represents that, and I agree with them. Uh, to interpret the Bible literally means to interpret it according to its literature. And uh, the literature here is signs. Um, so you put the time text together uh, uh, and with the signs that are here, and you get the, the clear indication that John is describing events that were, was near to him in his near future. Um, there's a book uh, we, we offer called The Days of Vengeance, which is a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the book of Revelation, which is very helpful in this particular area. One last thing before I close on this, again, uh, just as an introduction, I'm going quickly with this, uh, and that is the Antichrist. Uh, there are people today who continually identify somebody living in our day as the Antichrist, and if you study the history of Bible prophecy, you will note that uh, every generation has had its 
had its antichrists. But if you look at John's gospel, I mean John's epistle, the first epistle, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John says, Children, it is the last hour. Now this fits with everything related to those time texts. It's the last hour. Uh, things were said to take place shortly. The time is near. John, writing near the, the time when, when Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, says it's the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. And uh, so John is saying, look, you heard Antichrist is coming. Actually, there are many Antichrists. And, but the fact that there are many Antichrists is an indication that it's the last hour. It's the, the, the culmination of these prophetic events that Jesus talked about are coming to fruition. <clears throat> Definitionally, we're, just, we're told what an Antichrist is. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. So here, that's the definition. 2 John uh, verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So this isn't some end time political figure. This is somebody, this is a religious figure. This is somebody who denies that Jesus is indeed uh, who he says he is. Uh, this relationship between the Father and the Son. The very thing that Jesus was, was questioned about and persecuted about in the Gospels. That he had this unique relationship with the Father. At one point they wanted to pick up stones to kill him because Jesus identified himself with the Father saying, the Father and I are one. So this, this brief analysis of, of Bible prophecy um, really demonstrates that if you take the Bible seriously and let the Bible interpret itself, you can come to no other conclusion than that the Bible is in fact telling us that the majority of these prophecies have already been fulfilled. And so there are the people today who are uh, pushing an end time agenda are really misreading the Bible. And it's my contention uh, that this misreading of the Bible has a, has a grave effect on the cultural application of the gospel. It has implications for this world. If we get this eschatological uh, position settled, if we, if we have a council on this or some sort of for, forum on this, I believe that we will see the effect of the gospel go around the world like we've never seen it before because people will take this world seriously, they will take their salvation seriously enough that they will not be always opting out for some escape. Um, again, the, the two books I would recommend that you take a look at for further uh, um, support of this position is my book, Is Jesus Coming Soon? and Last Day's Madness.